Oh, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, um, just surrounded by four sisters, and um, yeah, it's been, been I guess, a, one of the gifts to be able to celebrate big uh, days for them and to be there uh, in, in like a really prime position and um, right, right there as uh, they take their vows. Or I'm about to go to New Zealand and uh, do the baptism with one of my nieces. So. <laughs> But it's good to be with you tonight and uh, to speak about uh, Jesus as, as the Lord. And I was, just when I was just preparing uh, the talk, uh, the scripture came to mind, I thought I'd just read it, and really is the basis for this, this whole talk. And it's the, um, the Philippians hymn. Uh, so I'll just read it. And yes. <clears throat> so let the same mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. So this is from Philippians uh, 2, verse uh, 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born as in human likeness, and being found in human form, he was humble. He humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <coughs> so, just this, this is a beautiful hymn, uh, St. Paul, that uh, just speaks of uh, what God has done for us, that he is, he is the Lord of all, uh, Lord of all creation, and that he humbles himself. From that place and goes to to the lowest place that Jesus becomes one of us and he's humbler even yet uh, to accept death on the cross and it's from that low place the lowest place uh, that the father raises him up to to the highest place and so I wanted to I guess speak about uh, Jesus as the Lord and particularly that he's the Lord, even in our darkness and in our pain and in our weakness, in our sinfulness, that the Lord is uh, Lord even in that place, uh, that he comes into that place and lifts us up. Uh, when I was younger, this is pretty young, I'm with these young brothers sometimes I feel a bit old, but uh, I used to skateboard and one of the tricks I used to do was uh, you stand on the edge of a half pipe, I guess sort of similar to the, the seats here, but a lot more deeper. And you stand over the edge with the skateboard on the edge. So you kind of come out here on probably the camera, but you stand over the edge and then you have to slam down the uh, skateboard. And if you don't commit to it, uh, you get the wobbles and then you fall over. <laughs> and so you have to fully commit and slam down the front of the skateboard and then you, you, know, you go right down the bottom hopefully you come back up and then you kind of do this lovely thing otherwise you fall over and hurt yourself um, but just that experience of fully committing just reminds me of uh, just what Jesus has done for us a bit more than uh, slamming down on a skateboard but that he's fully committed that he uh, wasn't sort of half maybe I might do it maybe I might come down he's fully committed to us and he's willing to go to whatever lengths it takes to, to bring us to himself. And even to go into to death itself and to, to raise us up. And so a story I uh, read when I was in my novitiate uh, was a story of a country preacher. And so in America, and he, one day he was reading in Time magazine. And on the front cover there was these four boys few boys on the front cover and they were uh, gang members in, in New York and he felt that the Lord was calling him to uh, to go and to preach to these boys 
and to try and save them before they would go into prison. They'd uh, done some terrible crimes. And so he's, he goes to his congregation and asks for some money to try to gather some money so that he could go to New York and to preach to these boys. And so they're generous enough and they give him some money and he gets on a plane and, and gets to New York. And when he's there, he goes to the courtroom uh, where these boys are, uh, you know, they're being judged. And as the trial's going on, you know, he's thinking, how am I going to speak to them? And as, he, as the, sort of, the trial's winding up and they're about to, um, you know, they're going to go to jail, he thinks, this is my only chance. And so he kind of goes up the front and he's got his Bible, he's holding his Bible, and he's going to try and preach to them. And then the guards or the police, they kind of grab him and then they sort of escort him out of the, uh, out of the courtroom. And, you know, the press is there, they love that, they take photos of it. And so he's very embarrassed and uh, he never gets to speak to them. And so he goes back home and um, you know, feeling pretty, you know, he didn't kind of work, a bit of a failure. And then a few days later, he feels on his heart again to go back uh, to go back to, to New York. And so he, he's uh, faithful to the Lord, so he goes to his people and asks them again. And they are pretty annoyed at him this time because he's made a fool of, of himself. And so they're not so willing this time. But somehow he's able to you know, get them to uh, give him some money so that he's able to go. And he goes back. And then when he's, uh, he's, he's he doesn't even know what he's, who he's going to speak to, he knows he's meant to go, and he knows he's meant to speak to just this street kids and, and bring them the love of God. He doesn't know who though, and so he he just drives around and he sees a young uh, young person, and the young person actually asks for his shoes, and so he takes his shoes off and gives them to him, and then he and they, this person leads him to this gang, uh, gang, and one of the boys recognizes him, and he says that. You know, the police don't like you. I've seen you on the newspaper and they don't like they don't like us. And so we're the same. And then they uh, let him into their gang and, and so he not to join it but to just to go in where they where they are and and he's able to slowly kind of win them over. Um, and he eventually converts even the leaders of the gang. So this is a story of David Wilkinson. There's a book called The Cross and the Switchblade, which probably many of you have read. And so he's able to, because of his faithfulness, even though it was a humbling thing, uh, he's willing to, to trust in the Lord. And the Lord is so faithful to him and that he is able to, to bring the love of God to these, you know, these young people who are in real darkness and uh, in real struggle in their life. And to bring them to him, bring them to the Lord. And there's even one point where, where he's trying to preach to them and, and the gang, one of the gang leaders is just making fun of him, mocking him as he's preaching. And he just keeps saying, well, even if every, if you cut me into a million pieces, every piece will say that God loves you, that Jesus loves you. And so he knew just that the Lord, uh, this guy David will continue, he knew the love of God and he was willing to be faithful to him. And he experiences the faithfulness of God uh, as he responds to him. And that God is willing to go into the depths and using this man to bring uh, his love to, to these young people. And so God is with us, that Jesus has become one of us. He's the Lord of all, but he humbles himself to be one of us, to walk with us, uh, to know what it's like uh, in every way, Except that he didn't sin, but he was with us in every way. But he's humble yet. That it's not enough for him just to walk alongside us, to, to share our suffering, but that he's willing to go to the point of death, uh, to the worst thing that can happen to us. That Jesus goes right into that place. Uh, and a story from the Old Testament that often has helped me to kind of get some understanding of the cross one that I've shared before. But it's the story of Moses uh, in the desert where he's 
you know, with his people and, and leading them out of Egypt. And they've been going for a while now and they start to, to complain uh, just about the food. They've just been eating bread and manna all, all day and all night and getting sick of that. And they even complain about the quails um, that God sends and they just get sick of the quails as well. And so they complain and complain. And they'd rather be back in Egypt. They'd rather be slaves. Uh, even though they're walking towards the promised land, they'd rather just be slaves in Egypt. At least they can have some soup and some sort of uh, some sort of food that they would um, be better than what they're having in, in the wilderness. And so God sends fiery serpents into the camp. And as the people are bitten, they, they die. And so Moses is there in the middle, thinking, this isn't good. <laughs> Uh, meant to be leading these people and they're, they're dying all around. And so he cries out to the Lord and the Lord tells him to, to form a bronze serpent and to place it on a standard and, and to hold it up. And as the people look at that, then they're healed. Um, it's a sort of strange thing, strange image that the very thing that's causing them to die is lifted up onto a, a standard and, and then as they look at it, they're healed. <coughs> This was actually the reading of my first Mass, and I remember preaching about this, and I tried to think about, tried to think of a sort of a modern version of the story, and uh, and I was thinking about well, I like cooking roast potatoes, you know, roast potatoes, and you put them in the oven, and you want them to be nice and golden brown, and so you keep checking them, and so you pull, you, know, you open up the oven, get the tea towel or some oven mitts, and. But you burn yourself on the, on the oven trays. You're like, ah! You know, so then, it's not good. And then, um, so then my mum comes in, my little story, and, and she says, don't worry, it's okay. She goes in the cupboard and she gets an oven tray and then ties it on, on broomstick and then lifts it up and just says, look at that. And you'll be healed. <laughs> you just feel like, are you okay, mum? You need to go to the doctor. But just this strange image, the very thing that is causing us pain, causing us, you know, to, the people in the, in the wilderness to die, that this is what is lifted up. And this is really, uh, really trying to, to lead us towards the cross, that Jesus takes on sin. He enters into our sinfulness, even though he doesn't sin himself. He experiences what that's like, not just our, my sin, but the sin of every person, uh, and he carries that on, and he takes that burden upon himself. And as we look at Jesus on the cross, as we look at sin, even though it's, it's like the effects of sin, then we're healed. Uh, we know that scripture that as we gaze upon him, uh, that we are healed. And so Jesus has entered into our suffering and our pain and death itself, and he brings his lordship there. Uh, he brings his power into that place of uh, darkness and uh, abandonment from God, that he goes into that for us. That he's fully committed to go all the way. <coughs> he doesn't stop halfway, he goes all the way. And then if you read in Matthew's Gospel where when Jesus dies on the cross, uh, there's a number of things that happen. One of them is that the, the, the curtain in the, the temple is torn in two. At that very moment when Jesus dies on the cross. And it's the curtain that separates uh, the holy place to the holy of holies. The place of God's presence in the earth. And only the high priest was able to go into the holy of holies one day a year. Uh, on the feast of Yom Kippur. Which is the, the mercy seat. And so he would sprinkle uh, the blood of the sacrifice on the altar, on the mercy seat. On the Ark of the Covenant. And so that he would be able to make reparation for all the people's sins for that year. And so this was the most holy place, the holy of holies. But when Jesus dies on the cross, that the curtain is torn in two, and so that the presence of God is not just in the holy of holies, that he's taken the presence of God into the darkest place, uh, into, the, into Calvary, uh, into the place where it's the... the you know, for those that were criminals to be taken outside, who dies outside of Jerusalem, not as a prophet, but just as a criminal, 
And so he's able to take the presence of God to the lowest place and he makes it a holy place. Uh, he makes it a place of our salvation. That God takes the tree of death and he turns it into the tree of life uh, because he is he's the Lord, uh, that he can do all things. And so just as my little skateboard analogy that he goes to the lowest place, but from that lowest place that he goes, he's raised up. Uh, just as we read in the Philippians hymn, that his name becomes the name above all names, that every knee uh, should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. And so the one that loves us, the one that goes to the depths and is with us in the worst places of our lives. Uh, he is the Lord of those places. He's the Lord of all. And he doesn't just sit with us in that solidarity, but he lifts us up out of that place. And he brings us life and he brings us freedom and he brings us healing. One of the, the gospel stories of Jesus walking on the water, uh, when Jesus walks on the water towards uh, the, the disciples in the boat, um, that, that's an image of the Lordship of Jesus. Uh, because the, you know, the lake or the water, the ocean, uh, was the place in the Jewish mind of chaos and the demonic kind of forces, uh, the destructive forces. And so he's the Lord, and he walks over those destructive forces in our lives. He walks over the chaos uh, that sin can bring uh, in our own lives and in, in those around us, in our relationships. And he's the Lord of those places. He walks over them, that they're not too much for him. And so tonight, as we, um, we speak about Jesus as the Lord, um, that he's the Lord of our lives, and to make him the Lord, particularly of those places that we don't want him to be the Lord. Uh, you know, you've probably heard that, that sort of image of where we, at our own homes, and when we have people over, we can sometimes have a room. Uh, we do it out of pressure dream, <laughs> we just throw everything into the room, close the door, and then let the guests come in, welcome to our nice clean house. Uh, but he wants to come into that room full of all the junk that you've stuffed in there. You don't want anyone else to see, um, to let him into that place. And so we don't have to, when, we, when Jesus is the Lord of our lives, it's not about like when we commit ourselves to him, we don't commit ourselves to him in, in strength, uh, in real power. It's actually the opposite. And we don't have to make ourselves perfect to make Jesus the Lord of our life. Now, Jesus shows us the way. He shows us the way because he has surrendered himself, he has abandoned himself, he experiences what it's like to sin even though he doesn't sin himself, but he abandons himself to God in that experience, uh, that experience of feeling like God's not there, that experience of just feeling crushed and, and helpless, that he abandons himself to the Father, he trusts in him, um, he surrenders to him. And so as we uh, you know, commit ourselves today, as we make Jesus more of the Lord of our lives, that we want to surrender to him. We want to just surrender those places, those, you know, those things inside of us that we're not so wanting to, you know, we're not so sort of proud of and wanting other people to see, that we want to let him into those places, uh, to surrender ourselves to him. Uh, because he wants to be the Lord of, of the depths of our lives, not just the surface of our lives. And so Jesus is the Lord and we want him to be our saviour and for him to be our saviour we need to, uh, to let him in and to, rent, to surrender ourselves. In our weakness, even in our pride, when we try to do it ourselves, <coughs> just to surrender even that to him. I might just say a little prayer and then uh, we'll um, have an opportunity to just to recommit ourselves or to commit ourselves for the first time to the Lord. Uh, 
to surrender our life to him. So Father, we, we do come before you. We come in our weakness and whatever's going on in our lives, our worries and our anxieties. And we invite you into those spaces. We invite you even into our brokenness, Lord, and into our places that we are, feel shame, um, we feel very weak. We thank you that you are the Lord of all, that you are the Lord of the good things in our life, but also the Lord of uh, the deep pain and struggle. And tonight, as we commit ourselves to you, uh, that we do that knowing our own weakness and inviting you in, that you would lift us up, and that you would reveal your resurrection, your power in the midst of our struggle. Uh, that you would be the Lord of all and that you would be our, our Saviour, the Saviour that we can experience even today, that you are healing power in our lives.